it's a, been a way for them to say, I don't know exactly what happened to my family, you know, to my family, but this story fills in a lot of blanks for me. Welcome everyone and hi, I'm Carol Fitzgerald from Reading Group Guides, a website from the Book Report Network and the host of the Book Reporter Talks to video podcast series. And I am very, very excited to welcome you tonight. So this is our Bookachino Live Book Group event where our guest this evening is Lisa C. And we're gonna be talking about her first book On Gold Mountain, I have the original copy, which was published in 1995. The format tonight is going to be as follows. And let me start by noting that we're assuming that everyone here has either read the book or you're up for hearing a book about a family's history, uh, one that started an author's career, uh, one that may leave you inspired to read the book. I will begin with a discussion with Lisa, and then I'm going to have a member of the audience join us with a question. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to questions from the audience. Now, this is really important. If you have a question that you want to ask later on, have asked later on, if you could drop it down in the Q&A down below, not in the chat, in the Q&A, so that as the evening goes on, we will be looking at those questions and Austin, our voice of God, will come on later and ask those questions on your behalf. So just keep in mind, remember, chat is amongst yourselves, Q&A is for any questions, so Austin doesn't have to go through the chat looking for what you're dying to have asked. So with that housekeeping behind us, I want to welcome my friend, Lisa, to the stage. Hi, Carol. <laughs> I am so happy to see you. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is so wonderful. And I just have to say, I'm loving watching you know, everybody join and they're from everywhere. It's incredible. It's so much fun to be able to do an event like this. I mean, we could do an event like this. We wouldn't have people from Aruba. I saw somebody, Sarasota, Florida, all these places. Yeah. You know, I remember I picked I'm up- I'm going to keep looking. In fact, I'm going to shut that off. Oops, no, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't do that, Lisa. Don't do that. Don't do that. You might turn something else off. I picked up this book years ago when we were at the Miami Book Fair together. And in fact, I, my bookmark, and I'm notoriously bad for not using bookmarks, I have the books and books bookmark from That's when I bought the book. And I said, this is one of the few times I've ever used a bookmark inside a book. So people like write this down. This is one of the original copies. What we showed before was a later edition, I believe. So I'm looking forward to chatting with you about this book because we have known each other for years. I think it's back to 2005. And it's now all of a sudden we're going to talk about a book that you wrote before I even got to know you. So right. it's like the first book of your career. So let's start with why did you decide to write this book? What brought you to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm working for Publishers Weekly. I'm writing. And now what am I going to do? So um, I, so this is a family story and I'm trying to tell the history of the Chinese in America through the eyes of my own family. And my family was pretty unique. I have to say my great, great grandfather came from China to work on the railroad. My great grandfather came and stayed. He had four wives, one of whom was white. That's the family I'm descended from. 12 children. He was the first Chinese in America to own an automobile. He used to sell tickets to see a stuffed mermaid, all of these things. And because of that, over the last hundred years, there had been many people who'd approached our family to write a book or a magazine article or even a film script about the family. And always my family had said no. And there were really two reasons for that. On the one hand, they were incredibly arrogant, like, oh, why should we participate in your project? And on the other side, there was a lot of shame and embarrassment because, you know, so much of what they did was borderline illegal or full on out there illegal. You know? So that was how things had lasted for about 100 years. And now I just I did the math on a post-it just now. So uh, it's about 32 years ago, if you can believe it, a woman writer named Ruth Ann Lamakan contacted me to, because she was doing a book on prominent Chinese American families and she wanted to include our family. Actually, it has to be 34 years ago. And um, 
I called my great aunt. She said, you know, no, we don't participate in things like that. And then two years later, when that book, right when it came out, was on the eve of my great aunt's 80th birthday. We had this big banquet in Chinatown, and I got, a co got her a copy of the book. And the next day, her daughter called and said, you know, my mom realizes she made a mistake. Why don't you come over? And she wants to tell you some stories. And so that's how it started. That first day, I learned things I'd never heard before. My, you know, that my grandfather didn't have two wives. He actually, great grandfather, didn't have two wives. He actually had four. And kind of in passing, she mentioned the kidnapping. It took me two more years to get the story of the kidnapping. So that's how it started. But here's the, the thing that always kind of amuses me. When I started this, I was actually thinking of doing like a Christmas letter. You know how you, you say, oh, Johnny played soccer and we went to Italy on vacation and you pulled it up and put it in the Christmas in the holiday card. And obviously things got out of control. Just a little, just <laughs> a, little, a little out of control. Did no, you, that's what I thought. I thought, oh, I'll send this out to everybody at Christmas. So did you research and then work from an outline? Did you, like, how did the writing process happen? First of all, to research, then the writing or? I probably interviewed people for, and did research for two years first. Mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed about 70 friends, family, business associates, enemies. I uh, went to the town where my grandmother was from, where my great-grandmother was from. And of course, I went to the home village where Huang Si was from, my family is from in China. And, uh, you know, interviewed just all kinds of people, all kinds of archives. Um, so when I started, I did have a pretty actually very big outline. I think it was about 35 pages mm. because it was, you know, I was covering a hundred years <laughs> and just even thinking about how it was going to be divided up. Obviously I went chronologically, but um, there are a few little pieces in there that are different. You know, the, the Tyrus Wong section, the anime Wong section has, has a, they're like outside of time. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time. And was it hard to then edit the story that you were going to share? Like, was it, okay, you've got this outline, you've got the 35 page outline, but there is so much to share. There's so much to tell. Was there a moment of editing yourself before it went to somebody else to sit there and say, I can do this, but it's going to be so big to tell that story? It, I cut a lot before I turned it in. I, I don't know, Carol, if you remember Tom McCormick, mm -hmm. who yes. was the editor-in-chief at St. Martin's, and he was my editor for this book. Um, I, I think he's long off this planet, so forgive me for speaking ill of the dead, but he was not a very nice man. Mm -hmm. And this was um, my first book. And so he sent me an editorial letter that was probably 30, 40 pages long, in which he just kept saying, like, I don't like this person. This person is shallow. This person is this. And I'd be like, wait, wait a minute. That's my grandfather, who I love. <laughs> don't, don't, don't say that to me. And then he, he said in that letter, and I have about a thousand comments in the manuscript. Well, it was more like a thousand comments on page one, because he really didn't like it. I mean, he just really didn't like it. And again, my first book, and I've often thought that he was thinking I was just gonna pack up and go home. Um, but uh, we, I feel like this was a part where I really drew, not on my father's family, but on my mother's line where the women are very stubborn mm -hmm. and don't like being pushed around mm -hmm. and especially don't like being pushed around by men. So I just, I just thought, to, I really thought to myself, you know, you don't know who you're messing with here. Yeah. And the book came out great. You know, I mean, it was, it was a difficult process with him. It was one of the most difficult editorial um, things that I'd ever have ever gone through. But here we are, you know, tw I have to look at my post it again, 27 <laughs> years later. Right. And I, I'm sure, Carol, you've heard that saying that most books typically, typically have the same shelf life as yogurt. Yes. Well, this is a very old thing of yogurt at this point. Yeah, it's a, 
this is a long shelf life of yogurt, you know, definitely there. And, you know, we're going to get into why I think it's works for such a long time, because it's a real, it's a family story mm -hmm. on top of being a story that people are not going to really hear every day about family. This is not a family coming from Europe where a lot of families had come from. This is not a family that has been here for generations and has that story to tell. And a lot of the stories were lost along the way. And with your family, they were not because it was a more prominent family in the Los Angeles area. Well, I actually, I, I think that they're some, they were big storytellers. And, you know, we had this family store, these different family businesses. But in, in you know, when I was a child, this family store where my grandparents and my great aunt and uh, Ming and Benny were there. And at the end of the day, they'd go to what they called the back of the store. It was just this little alcove inside the front door. And they would tell the, I mean, they'd drink, you know, and have a snack, but they would tell these stories. And I think they, they always had this kind of tradition of one-upping each other with stories. And this happened at Thanksgiving, it happened at Christmas. Um, so, and, and certain, you know, like in every family, certain stories are those chestnuts that are told over and over and over again. But I also think that a lot of the stories were kept in the way that they were, you know, were um, for two reasons. One, in the early days, people were illiterate. And so this was, they had to, you know, this was how they kept the, the stories alive. Mm -hmm. But the second piece really had to do with immigration and the immigration officials, because you know they were being interviewed every six months because they, it was a legitimate business. Uh, you know, Fongsi was a merchant. And so he had to report to, I don't remember what it was called at that time, but sort of the equivalent of the INS every six months. And that's of course why I found so much, you know, so much documentation. Right. But, if you're doing that and you have this government record going, you have to stick to the story. So the dates have to be lined up. Everything has to be exactly the way it is. And yeah. there's no yeah. fooling and, around. Yeah, and the other thing I would say, I was uh, about 300 pages into writing and when um, I was invited to attend, it was like a symposium on Chinese American history. You know, one of the very first. And there was a woman there from the National Archive in San Bruno, which is right outside the San Francisco airport. And that's where they have all of the Angel Island immigration records. And I thought, well, I knew that my, you know, the family was going in and out of there a lot because they would travel back to China and come back. And um, she, the, the way in was either you had to have the immigration number, which I didn't have, or the business name, which I did have. Right. And I sent that to her and she called me and she said, you know, you better come up here. We have found more on your family than any other family to date. That is true all the way to today. Wow. And so when I went there, you know, you put the gloves on and yeah. you know, you're in the National Archive and, and they brought out this cart and you know, all these files boarding passes, health certificates, photographs that our family didn't have because we were too poor to have a camera um, or go to the photography studio very often. Um, and then all these interrogations. And I remember the first one I picked up was from um, 1901. I opened it up and there was my great grandfather speaking on the page. And it was just the most incredible thing because now of course I had dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, the things that he actually said, but there was another part of me that was like, oh no, I'm going to have to throw out the first 300 pages because this is the official record. But it turned out that that official record matched the, all those stories that I'd heard. That's what I mean, that they, they had to keep these stories intact, partly because they like to tell stories, but partly because there was this official paper trail with the government. Yeah, it's like where you can't say you were here, you were near, you were there, you were definitely came in yeah. and out those days. 
you know, you're half Chinese and we've talked about living in two worlds. Like you, because you see yourself as Chinese and then other people will sit there and say, well, no, are you really your Caucasian? Da, 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 back and forth. When you were writing the book, were you getting even more, um, you're getting more in touch with your family history, but were you feeling more a part of it as well when you were, were, were doing the writing or did you feel more distant? Yeah, so what was interesting for me was when I would go and interview, you know, a relative or a friend, and this happened quite a few times when someone would say, you know, you should go interview so-and-so, you know, he's Caucasian like you. And I had never known that my family saw me as, as actually very different. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that this is something that actually helped me not only with this book, but with all of the books that I've written that are you know, about China, the Chinese American experience or in China, because I've always been, a, I've been inside, but I've also been a little bit outside. And there's a sense that I've always been trying to explain myself to other people, but at the same time, always trying to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. It's going back both ways. Mm -hmm. you know, I love so many stories from the past. My favorite was about the laundry going back and forth to China and to get washed. And there are little kernels like this that enhance the storytelling. So for everybody who doesn't know the China like laundry story, can you share that one? And then are these little kernels the things that made it really so much fun to write the book too? Absolutely. So, um, well, I think really, you know, how I started with that was the fact that my great grandfather in Sac when he was in Sacramento, in the late 1880s, he had been doing a lot of jobs that immigrants do even today, washing dishes, working in the fields. But by the time he was 30, he had his first business. It was a factory that manufactured, as everybody knows, crotchless underwear for brothels. And so, you, you know, you look at a fact like that and you think, well, why did they need so many? You know, <laughs> why did you need all that underwear? And uh, in those days in California, it was, you know, about... 20 men for every woman. And so some of those women were married to people like Croc Crocker and Stanford and Huntington, but most of them were in the world's oldest profession, which meant that there was no one around to do the laundry. You know, those women were otherwise occupied. They were earning their, you know, a, a living already. And so people would send their laundry to China to be washed. It was a two month round trip. And I think about that a lot, you know, the boat comes in, the laundry comes off for about one week, everybody looks pretty good and it is really downhill fast. But that was why they needed to have, you know, all this extra undergarments. And in fact, I, and I think I mentioned it in the book, it's a long time since I wrote it, but there was the Guild of Bright Colored Clothing with 125 members. And they were all engaged in this, you know, this one business of making ladies underwear that are known for their fine, fine stitching. Yeah, fine, fine stitching. And this is the this is this was definitely something that was needed at the time. Grandfather yeah. definitely found a market that definitely needed to be filled. You know, is there anybody that you really wish you could have talked to beyond the research that was done that you could just sit down? I'm sure there's more than one, but was there one person that, wow, I would really have just liked to spend time and hear more? There were a couple of people actually. Uh, one was Anna Mae Wong's brother. And he, uh, you know, we had an appointment. We had, he would cancel it. We made another one, he would cancel it. And this went on for many months. And then there was one day he called me and he said, um, I don't want to participate in the project. And I remember talking to my mother and saying, you know, nobody asked. Anna Mae, if she would have wanted somebody to write about her. And my mom said, you know, we're, go start from that. And so I think that chapter about Anna Mae Wong begins with nobody asked me. And um, so I had to work around that, but he was somebody I really wished that I could have interviewed. And then the other person, and this happened very early, so my great grandfather's brother, his yeah. eldest son had a lot of stories because he was the oldest person still living mm -hmm. at the time. And I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go see him and I've gotta go see him and he died very suddenly. 
And so I, I actually did make a list sort of, you know, who's most important to talk to? What's the order? How old are these, you know, these particular people? Mm -hmm. Because I, it was such a lesson to me. And it's one that I've, you know, followed with every book ever since when, when I'm interviewing people is who, who am I in danger of losing if right. I don't, if I don't go out there now. And, you know, we think about that a lot in our family because my grandfather on my mother's side was the only person who came over from Italy. The entire rest of the family is still in the village and they, they own places there and places in Rome. And my mother went over years ago. She says, I'm kneeling in the same place he was in church and all this stuff. And I said, did you ask why he came? And she didn't ask. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to figure out, like, are we going to lose the people? And I was thinking of that when you were saying that of who really know why he left because everyone else stayed. So yeah. what was the reason? Was he adventuresome? Like, tell me some things about him. So once the world calms down and you can go someplace, that's like my mission is to go figure out before somebody is telling me a story that's not really the truth because it's been the family legend they made up. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, and that's why, you know, at the end of chapter one and, and then chapter one, I think is called the wonder times. because mm -hmm. That's so early. I can't. I couldn't confirm everything. And so at the very end of the chapter, I said, this is how it could have happened. Mm -hmm. But the, the person I was talking about was um, Danny Ho, the one who died. He had told me on the phone that my great, great grandfather had not returned to China, that they had, he and the other sons had gone up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. See, I had no way to, you know, it was just a story at that right, point. Right. I had no way to follow it up. So there were all these different versions. That's the only chapter in the book where, where it's really a little fuzzy. Everything else was very nailed down and, you know, different people telling me this is how it happened. What I've tried to do is have multiple people tell me this is how it happened. And then that's what I would go with. And the, plus, plus the paper trail. Was it hard to be objective about the family? Like you're writing some things that are hard. You're writing some things that are difficult. And you can't, you're telling a story of history. You can't rewrite history. So you can't soft code it. Was, ever, was that tough to do at any point? There, yes. Um, and I think the, probably the person that was most difficult to write about was um, Uncle Ray. And he, he's sort of the villain of the family. You know, a lot of families have that. Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, Aunt Betty, Betty, she's the villain of the family. You know, and, and he was really the villain of the family. And even his daughter thought of him that way and I remember but I I and this did come from Tom McCormick you know you have to make these people you have to try to understand what their thinking is mm -hmm. and I put a lot of thought into how he was viewing the world and what he accomplished and the prices he had to pay for that and um there's some very telling stories when his fact, you know, stories in there when his factory come, burns down and his father comes and says, I'll help you. And he's like, I, I don't want your help. And what that would mean in the moment. So when his daughter, uh, my Aunt Polly read it, she said, I, I, this is the first time I've ever understood my father. Wow. And, and that was just, again, trying to separate out from the family story and the way the family looked at it and to try to be objective, at, you know, as, as best I could. Yeah. You know, I, co I confessed in not being aware of a lot and that the Chinese could not live outside Chinatown until 1948. And thus this, you know, spurred some traditions that happened in that area because, and to this day, there's still places culturally, you go into the city, it's Chinatown, you go to San Francisco, Chinatown, and those cultures still exist there as like nobody else is coming in. This is our turf. This is our whatever. Am I right of feeling that that's what's going on even today? Well, of course, there are Chinatowns all around the world because yeah. everywhere the Chinese went. But the but actually, interestingly, the second time I've addressed this today, I did a podcast earlier, and that was one of the questions. And the thing is, Chinatown is still a place where new immigrants can come. And yes, it may evolve and, and be... Um, you know, more part of the city or a place where everybody comes to get dim sum. Um, here in Los Angeles, a lot of uh, Chinatown is now younger people who've opened galleries. So a lot of change. 
But within that, it's still the place where ethnic Chinese come uh, to, and they get their start. And so in Los Angeles Chinatown, for example, you have not, not that many Chinese from China, but ethnic Chinese from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Thailand, and they're coming in the same way um, you know, that, that my great grandfather and great great grandfather came not without very much. You know, they're not they're not the ones coming with a suitcase of cash. These right. are people who are coming with very little, and you can open up a little stall, 20, 20 by 20 feet, and um, sell t-shirts, or you can sell CDs, or you know, d- different kinds of things that don't require a lot of capital, but give you your first start. Yeah, and you can get, this is how your, your foot into America. This is your foot to get going. You know, at a time where we're talking so much about inclusion, and we're talking about how do we have everybody, I feel like reading a book like this would be so interesting to high school students to take a look at what happened with a family over a hundred years. Has this been part of curriculum places where it's actually being taught? Because I found it fascinating to just say, here's a slice of a family over a hundred years. I did a virtual event um, for Texas Humanities last year that was geared towards high school teachers, um, where we, where it was a way to talk about immigration issues today, immigration issues on the Texas border. If you remember, there was a lot of stuff going on and still is, um, but to try to put it in this larger perspective or, or larger view. And I am in a couple of weeks doing an event for teachers here in Los Angeles. Um, and it's, that's going to be geared sort of kindergarten through high school wow. with different kinds of projects that people can, you know, for different types of grades, kinds of projects that might be a roots project or um, how to interview your grandparents and how is, you know, how is your, your experience similar to the or different from this experience? Because of course, mm-hmm. here in Los Angeles, we have so many people who have come from other parts of the world and are living that immigrant experience. You know, yeah, it's this still is there. Something that happened in the past, it's ongoing. Mm-hmm. It has a, a, lot of part, a lot of things haven't changed. Right. It's just more modern now, but it's still and, people coming in with not much, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll say I don't go back and read my books, but um, you did mention the opera up at the, at the beginning of this. And I wrote that, uh, it was produced in 20, 2001, I think, originally, and is now the second production. So, you know, the composer has been calling me and we've been having these meetings and the director and they'll say, oh, is this a typo? You know, like, well, did you mean this or this? And, but what has, and I've gone to a couple of the rehearsals, what has struck me is how much the language of the bullies in that are, it, it's, it's like you could hear it right now today. Mm. So as much as we've changed, there are a lot of ways that we haven't changed at all or haven't changed enough. I, I haven't changed enough. I think it was just talking about, you know, I was also thinking when I was reading chapter two, exclusion, which takes place from 1872 to 1893. And I was thinking of two current series for people because let's, let's relate it to something that's going on in the world right now on television. <laughs> Sounds crazy. 1883 on Paramount Plus, where the people are traveling west from Texas to Montana and the Gilded Age, which is the HBO show that we have many different opinions about. Both of these shows have been Hollywoodized, but it's the backdrop of history that's the same time frame. So when you watch these people are taking wagons west, uh, going up to Montana, you watch people trying to go to balls and like be friends with Mrs. Astor in New York. And then you realize what's going on in California during the same time. Yeah, yeah. And it's when you sit there, you're seeing, I sort of want to go back and do like a history of America, like looking at a time frame and take it what's happening really across the country during that mm-hmm. time frame, because mm-hmm. it's completely different. And it's the, I think it's interesting to see what was happening in America during that time. And this book brings in this whole different perspective of what's happening on the West Coast that people are trying to get to Oregon or they're trying to get to California and what's happening there. Yeah. 
and we're looking over that same thing of time. You know, the book was updated. What inspired that? And when was it updated? Do you know? You know. Uh, so we were going to do it for the 20th anniversary, but then my the paperback editor, Luann Walther, she just said, let's just do it. So I think it was for the 17th year. So now I'd have to, you know, work on my post-it to figure out when that was. Uh, and that would be this version. Yes. And um, what the main thing that had happened was, uh, after the book came out, um, you know, I had gone up to Medford, Oregon to do research on my great grandmother, Ticey. And I had gone to the historical society there and had just found all this amazing stuff. We can talk about that later, but I mean, it was just so, um, just, you know, a diary uh, written by a a reverend on the weekends, but a farmer during the week who was with my great great grandmother when she died and he presided at her funeral. So, I mean, this was just an amazing find. And um, then when the, and she always kept sending me stuff and it was just, she was so helpful. And then when the book came out, there was one day where somebody came in and they wanted to look up their family and it was the Pruitt family and she put two and two together. So they had invited me up there to speak. And, um, you know, through the book signing line came these people who introduced themselves as Ticey's brother's descendants. Just so incredible. And it turned out that although we had always heard that, you know, they totally disowned her, they never saw her again, she was sending them photos of the kids. You know, they were bringing out photos to show me, oh, here's, you know, Ray and when he was a baby and here's Milton when he was a baby. And then a few years after that, or it must be around year 15, my cousin was kind of, you know, we both had to do a lot of cleaning out of family things and our families kept everything. So um, she found letters that had been written by from the Pruitt family to Ticey over all of those years. And so this, you know, even though they had shown me photos, even though they said, oh yes, you know, we were in contact, I somehow just couldn't accept it, you know, because I'd had this whole lifetime of like, she was disowned and I never saw her again. But reading those letters, I, it, it just completely, um, changed how I thought about what had happened. And so I guess you could say that was a mistake in the original story, but to have those new discoveries was, um, you know, everybody felt like I, I had to add some, you know, that chapter. Yeah. And it's all the things that, oh, I think I have it all, but now here's a new perspective. Here's something new that's going on. You know, you've got this great section on your website called Step Into the World of Gold Mountain and on Gold Mountain. And the feedback on that's got to be terrific of people being able to, if anybody hasn't been to Lisa's site and gone into that area and just seen more about the book, more, you know, behind the scenes and whatever, I highly, highly recommend it. And what do you get as feedback from people that like discover the book and now you've got all this material for them to go in and discover and enjoy? Well, you know, I have, I have a step inside the world of for, I think all of the books yes. and um, it is a way for people if they have a question or they want to know more, or let's say about foot binding, they can go there. Or they want to know more about, in this case, you know, the Exclusion Act or more about Angel Island or more about um, there's some, you know, uh, Chinese restaurants in the 1930s. You know, th here's a, a place that they can go without going all through Google. You know, and, and, it, and I have photos of what it looked like then and now and, of course, videos and and all of that. But what I have, and I, and readers love that and book clubs especially love, love those resources. But for me, what's been the most incredible are the people who say, you know, we don't really know how grandpa got here. You know, just like you were saying, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know, they, they never talked about that. You know, he obviously had to have gone through Angel Island. He never mentioned it. Um, or, you know, we found some papers after he died and we'll just say Fong wasn't his real last name. He was actually an Aang, so a paper son. 
-hmm. And without, so um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that people, it's been a way for them to say, I don't know exactly what happened to my family, you know, to my family, but this story fills in a lot of blanks for me. Mm -hmm. It fills in, this is what might have happened. This is this where is they what, might have come in. Or, you know, I never heard of Paper Sons. Now they're going to know what, what Paper Sons paper are sons and what, are what that process was. So let's go back to the opera for a second. You, your role was writing the libretto and you wrote that back in like 2000. So tell us about that and how that came about. And then it's going to be um, performed again in May in Los right. Angeles. In May in the, uh, at the Huntington Library and Garden, but specifically in the Chinese Garden. Um, yeah, I'm so excited about it. I'm just so excited. Yeah. I just can barely <laughs> stand it. Um, so I hope people who are watching, you know, if you're in Southern California, please come. It's going to be great. Uh, so go way back in time. I do love opera and uh, we, we have gone, you know, they've invited us to different things over the years, like come and tour the costume shop or come and see this, you know, just sort of side things. And this particular evening was a visit to the costume shop. And uh, I'm actually, I'm quite shy. I'm really very, very shy and, and typically kind of a wallflower, especially in a situation like that. And this woman came up and she started talking to my husband and me, and she was very, very nice. And uh, she, it turned out she was the wife of the director of the opera. And as a thank you, I sent her a copy of the book, just saying, thank you, know, thank you for being so gracious and kind to us at, at dinner. The next time we went to the opera, uh, she and Peter came running up to me and they said, during intermission, they said, we have an idea. And so the, this, that's how it started. And they put us, uh, they put me together with a composer, Nathan Wong, and a director. And that, and the director was terrific because, you know, there was nothing written at that point. So he really helped to shape the story because how do you take a hundred years and reduce it to 90 minutes? You know? <laughs> so it's really the love story between Taisi and Fangxi. And, um, but it's, you know, there, there are a lot of fun things in there. It starts when he's in the home village. It does have, I think all four wives, um, at least three of them. And, you know, there's a, a very fun piece call, uh, called, um, fancy underwear for fancy ladies, you know, that has to do with his underwear business when he was in Sacramento. Oh, that's really fun. Have they changed anything for this um, new performance? Only, so just a couple of things. I mean, this is a completely different uh, performance in the sense that originally it was in a theater and now we're outside in a Chinese garden. And, um, you know, we have to work within the confines of this unbelievably beautiful garden, but all, that also, like, you can't attach anything to a building and, you know, all of these restrictions. But also, we, it's a woman um, director, her name is Jennifer Chang, and she has had some very creative ideas for staging, and, um, you know, it's a new choreographer. So if somebody saw it 20 years ago, this will be will be completely different but different performance oh i love this and then just like this. one thing at the beginning originally uh it opens with fong si as an old man with his one of his great grandchildren who in the original opera was one of his great grandchildren love it I love and it. he's sort of singing to this boy who am i you know how did i how, how did i end up here and, and the little boy is asking questions. And now um, just for, you know, COVID reasons and you don't have to have a teacher on the set all the time that uh, it's going to be, instead of a dialogue with this great grandson, it's going to be more to the, to the choir. Mm -hmm. I've got it. So we don't have to worry about certain things at this particular right. moment, at this particular moment. Well, we're gonna to go to reader questions in a moment, which I hope you've been dropping down in the Q&A section, not in the chat though. I do see this is one of the most active chats that I've seen. Um, I think we are gonna save the chat after this because I've seen some great comments. And we're going to bring up Arlene Horowitz, who's gonna join us with a question from the audience. So Arlene, here you go. Okay, um, uh, as a family history, Gold Mountain is very thorough 
but how did you reconstruct the thoughts and dialogue of Fangxi and Taisi? Were these family stories? Is any part of their story imagined? How really, the only part, thank, first, thank you so much, uh, Arlene. Um, I would say again, the only part that's really imagined is in that first chapter. Otherwise, I would, um, especially with Taisi and Fangxi, of course they were, had passed when I started the book. And so I was really relying on other people to tell me, oh, I was there this day and I heard this. And then if somebody said that, I'd say, who else was there? Mm -hmm. And then I would get the other person and you know, somebody else to tell me, this is how it happened. And, and, but what surprised me again was that usually the stories were pretty, so pretty um, very rarely did somebody have a completely contradictory um, version of events, but that was the main way. And then, you know, having with, with the, the interrogation records that, and it's like a tremendous amount of material, 500 pages of material that when Fong Si is talking, that can also be his thoughts. And then uh, with Taisi, she was so close to her daughter, Sissy. And Sissy is, you know, who started this whole project. And so uh, she, she spoke so much about her mother, was so close to her mother. So I always felt that whatever she thought she said about her mother, you know, what she thought her mother thought had to be very accurate. Great. Thank you so much, Arlene. We appreciate your being on camera to share your question with us. Thank you. You're welcome. And now we're going to have Austin go to the questions that are down in the Q&A. You can keep adding, folks. You can keep adding down there. And Austin, um, take it away. Do you have questions for us? Yeah, so why don't we start with one from Mira. Uh, she asks, you wrote a trilogy of mysteries, a body on a ship in the port of Los Angeles and in China the body of a son of an important American in China. And these three books were wonderful and frightening. Do you plan on writing mysteries again? So, you know, David and Hulan, the two characters of that book, they went through so much. I mean, you think people have had a hard time in my historical novels? No, not like David and Hulan. And so I, I like to think of them being you know, on a beach somewhere, sitting in under, under an umbrella and the palm tree and drinking a drink with a little, you know, thing in it. And, and um, I've had that question so many times that honestly, I, I have kind of like boilerplate that I can send back in an email to people. And one day I got an email back saying, I, I see it. I see it exactly. They're on the beach. The waves are coming. They're drinking a drink with that little umbrella in it. And all of a sudden, a big bloated dead body washes up on the shore. So I just love that so much. The, the problem is those books were in real time. You know, they were right to the years that I was writing about in China. And so I'd have to, now I'm gonna look at my post-it again. I'd have to go back. I mean, they, if I stayed with them in real time, they'd have to be, solving crimes in their walkers you know it would be very <laughs> difficult and then to go back in time it, China has changed so much from the time period that I was writing about even though they were set in you know I think it's like 1997 uh, 2000 maybe 2001 somewhere in there but you know it's just a few years that I, I think of those books almost, in a way they are like historical novels um, because China's completely different now, even though it's not that long ago. And I see them as like little snapshots of a very particular moment. Now, that's not to say that I don't have another mystery up my sleeve. I, I, um, there is an element in the new book that is, has a little bit of a mystery. And, Actually, if you think about my historical novels, all of them have some element of a mystery to them. And they're very much structured like, like mysteries, even though it might not be so obviously like a dead body on page one. But mm -hmm. if you think about Snowflower right. uh, and the Secret yeah. Fan, you know, here's this old woman, she's got this fan, there's something in there 
that is a secret <laughs> and it's not going to be revealed in, for another 350 pages. From Denise, what writers are inspiring you right now or who are you reading? So I, I always hate to admit this, but I don't read fiction when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I don't want anybody's voice to seep into my head, even inadvertently. I know so many writers, they read a, you know, a novel a week or a novel every day, I, and I, I'm happy for them, <laughs> but I can't do that. And part of it is, you know, I'm writing always about a very specific culture in a very specific time. I, I hope I would never write a sentence like this, but, you know, I could never write the feeling was electric if they don't have electricity. Or um, I remember with Snowflower and the Secret Fan, there was a place where I had wanted to use the word naive. And, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says childlike. But I find naive to be much more nuanced than that. But these girls in 18th century, in an 18th century village in China would never have been exposed to that word. They were, just couldn't use it. So I feel like it's a little bit like I'm putting blinders on. So when I finish a book, I go on a big reading tear. And yes, I love all those girl books, Girl on a Train, Girl in a Window, Gone Girl. You know, I just got to read them, just have to. I um, always like to go on, look at what's on the bestseller list that's come out of nowhere. So the book, I think it's still lingering, you know, after all this time is... Um, the where the crawdads sing. Oh, where the crawdads sing. Where okay. the crawdads sing. And, you know, the reason why I'm attracted to those kinds of books is because that's what happened with Snowflower. Nobody expected that book to take off in the way that it did, and yet it did. And so I'm always, you know, finding those books and thinking, what was it about this book in this moment? And then I do, you know, like to read a, a classic of some sort. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit I have never read To Kill a Hop Mockingbird. I mean, how shocking is that? I should just throw me out, you know, just hang up right now. Um, but I, a couple, the last time I finished a book, I um, read um, Ask the Dust by John Fonte, who was a, a writer in Los Angeles in the 30s. There is a John Fonte Square in downtown Los Angeles. I have either been driven through it or driven through it, you know, probably a thousand times in my life, but I'd never read any of his work. So you can see I'm pretty eclectic in, in what I like to read. I love mysteries. You know, I'm always there for the next Michael Connolly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just actually picked up um, the new Harlan Coben. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love mysteries. I love a good mystery. Yeah, I love it's good funny, story. There are, there are a few people in the chat saying, you have to pick up To Kill a Mockingbird. I know, it's a horrible embarrassment. Well, maybe that will be the new one. That will be what I'll, you know, this, now that I've just finished the new book, that can be my, my classic. I'm I've sure you'll enjoy it. Yeah. From I'm watching Donna. a little dog on the couch watching you. Is there a little dog? <laughs> There's a little dog that all of a sudden yeah. on the couch. <laughs> I'm actually dog sitting. He's my son's dog and my son and his fiance are in Finland right now oh. um, looking at the Northern Lights. Okay. Um, so I, I have Kobe there for a couple of weeks. He's, he's Sometimes we're interviewing sport. people and the dog goes on the couch and they go, the dog's not make... allowed on the couch. Oh. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From Donna, uh, were there any really meaningful family stories that you couldn't include in the book? Um, you know, there was actually only one thing that I didn't include that several people asked me not to include. And it seemed so minor to me that I, it didn't bother me not to include it, which was that one of the cousins had TB. Hmm. Which seems, you know, again, doesn't seem that important, but in the family that meant, you know, we were living in crowded conditions, we were poor, that the, all the sort of stereotypes about, you know, being in a dirty environment, and, and it was still so embarrassing that they just, you know, please don't include that. But I mean, if you think of all the other stuff I included, my grandfather's affair, my grandmother had kept all those letters that she found and then what she wrote to the lady and what that woman wrote back to her and oh my gosh. 
But the um, TB was off limits. <laughs> yeah, but the TB was off limits. From Debbie, if you were to write this book again today, what do you think you would do differently? Well, first of all, I wouldn't be able to um, because all the people, almost all the people are gone now. And actually, this is one of the reasons why the book has remained, you know, in print and read so widely is that I'm not the only one who couldn't do it. No one else could either because no one else can go back that far as I did at that time. Mm. And uh, that's you know why it's taught in high school, why it's taught in colleges, that, that, that it is unique in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but what would I, I mean, I don't even know where I could start because really all I would have would be archival material. And I wouldn't have those voices except for maybe my father and a couple of cousins, but you know, all the people who helped me so much and who really just opened their hearts to tell me of their experiences. You know, a lot of it was very harsh, very sad, um, a lot of hardship. Uh, you know, Fong Si has a pretty nice ride, but everybody else, mm-hmm. it's pretty tough. And so I, I don't even know where I could begin with that. You know, even something like the story of the kidnapping, there's no one left alive who could talk to me about that. Um, let's see, somebody asked uh, at the end of your book, you mentioned that in every book you have written your grandma Stella, uh, that, that she appears in one form or another. And what intrigued you the most about grandma Stella's life? She was so incredibly strong. Um, She also had a lot of hardship. You know, she was on her own basically from the time she was six. You know, they were, her parents would like, you know, pin her name and a destination on her pinafore and stick her on a train. She came down to Los Angeles by herself when she was 16 to take care of an aunt who was dying of TB. It was very gruesome death. And, I, I think when she met the family and especially Ticey, she was almost like an octopus on a rock. She was just like, this is the family I don't have. This is the family I have to have. Mm-hmm. And so even though she was very young, she just, <laughs> you know, and over the years, she, you know, she was very much a wife and mother but she also had so much creativity in her and worked on a lot of the antiques doing restoration. But I also, and this kind of relates to the last book, The Island of Sea Women. If people have read that, you know that Yongsuk and Mija make these rubbings. And then at the end of the story, spoiler alert, um, you know, Yongsuk opens them up and for her, they tell a story that only she could understand. And when I was writing that book, I kept thinking, how can these girls have some way to preserve memories? They're illiterate, so they can't write anything. Didn't have a camera, you know, didn't have an iPhone. So how can they do that? And then finally, I thought of my grandmother, who, when she, you know, was always a just very intrepid, again, because she'd been traveling by herself since she was six went all around the world. They had very little money. I mean, my grandma's parents' house was 600 square feet. So, um, you know, very little money, very little in the way of extravagances, but they saved all their money to travel. And um, after my grandfather died, she, she went around the world by herself, traveling third class through India. Anyway, I can remember when she would come back from these trips and she'd open her suitcase and she'd have all these folded up um, pieces of paper and I'd open them. And, you know, because she'd made rubbing. And um, now I was in a temple in Cambodia. Oh, now I'm in Japan. Now I'm in India. And it was just incredible to me. So I, I just feel like she was so much a part of forming me of who I became um, and I miss her still so much. And, I, I, and sometimes I don't even realize that a character that I'm writing is her until I start editing and it's like, oh, there she is again, <laughs> you know? But it's been a way for me to be with her 
mm -hmm. um, to have these characters that, that you know, may not look like her, may be in a different time period, but that have an element of her character that allows me to spend time with her. Mm. And more about family, Sue asks, I thought about the short meeting between Ray and Fong after the fire and wondered if the dialogue was fiction. How would that specific dialogue be known or created? So um, from Ray's wife, uh, who told me that, and then also that was a pretty well-known story. Um, she was probably the main person, you know, who told me, have told it to me first, but that was a very well-known story within the family um, because it was this kind of standing up to this man. And uh, I heard that from many different people. And I would even open that up to, uh, I guess, any dialogue that you're writing. How can you be sure how it happened or, or how much are you able well, to- I, I, I mean, I have really addressed that already. Just, you know, mm. some of it can, comes at, using the transcripts of the interrogations allowed me to build dialogue, but also like, here's an example. Um, when the family partnership broke up mm -hmm. and uh, Ray again is the villain of that. Um, I, my father was there, he was young. Um, Ray's daughter was there. They both told me what they saw and heard. Sissy was there. My grandmother was there. So, you know, you talk to a bunch of people and they say, mm. this person said this, and then this happened, and this person said this, and then this happened. And, you know, there may be variations within it. So it was really my job to try to figure out what is the clearest seems to be the truest story because of course we all know from watching law and order svu that everybody sees things differently mm -hmm. that that guy was wearing a leather jacket no it was a, a hoodie you know so that eyewitnesses see and hear things differently so you're tr so in a way um i'm like an investigator right that i'm trying to get to what is the closest to the truth that i can mm -hmm. There are quite a few people asking about the LA Opera event and whether it will be recorded or live streamed and how they can see it. Yeah, unfortunately, it won't be live streamed. There's a big issue with the union that won't allow that. But and and we're actually there are people uh, negotiating with the union right now to see if they can make a recording that would would be for use by the Huntington only, so more educational, but they think that they would be able to stream it in an educational way, but we're still just waiting to hear back from the union. Okay, and there are a few- I never thought I would have to think about. <laughs> never thought you'd have to think, we never yeah. thought you'd have the opportunity to live stream. Think about that, you know? Let's see, uh, well, somebody- I have a question that no one's asked. What did the family think? Mm. Yeah, well, actually, I was just about to ask what what uh, somebody somebody asked what were some examples of what happened in your family after the book was published. So um, we had a part, and again, my first book, we the first uh, book, my very first book event was in Pasadena at Roman's Bookstore, a wonderful, wonderful independent bookstore, and you know the whole family came. They were very good sports. This was the original hardcover. Um, and they came through and they bought a copy. And then as the evening wore on, you could hear people in the kind of corner saying, oh, look, here's a picture of my mother. Oh, we don't have a picture of her. Oh, here's a picture of me when I was a baby. I, the first photo I have of myself is when I joined the army. So I had found, I can even kind of hold it up, you know, these kinds of photos that were the immigration photos that the government took, that the government kept, and I found that the family had never seen. And so then it was so sweet. They came through and bought like 10 books. And <laughs> it was my very first event and totally sold out of all the books. So that was, I, I think that only ever happened one other time. So that was pretty exciting. But, um, you know, not everybody loved it. Uh, um, my uncle Gilbert's sister, so his mother's the one who ran the uh, Chinese language school. She never, she never spoke to me. 
Mm. And that was pretty tough. Um, my dad didn't read it, didn't read it, didn't read it, didn't read it, didn't read, you know, just waiting and waiting and waiting, didn't read it, didn't read it. And then finally, like six months later, he called me and said, I read your book. Um, it kept me up all night. And that's all he's ever said about it. Mm. And then uh, years later, my uncle uh, Chen asked to be buried with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can sort of see a range of how people uh, felt. And, you know, in the case of Margie, Gilbert's sister, she didn't like what I wrote about her mother. Guess where I got all of that information from her. <laughs> so um, I, I always felt like that was a little unfair because those, those stories were her story. I think we have time for one more question. Um, a lot of people are curious about um, the book that you just finished up, what you're working on next, um, and when your next book is coming out, if you know the release date or anything like that. So what can you tell us? Okay, so first I'm going to answer one of those questions. What's the next book? I only sent it off today, so I don't know <laughs> what the next one is going to be. All right, if you're the kind of person who gets a little seasick, just close your eyes for a second. So over here, that's some of my research. And when the pandemic hit, I thought I knew what the next book was going to be, but it was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into the interior of China. Couldn't go in 2020, not 2021, not this year. I don't see it anywhere on the horizon, frankly, for China. So I, I just spent a lot of 2020 just thinking my life is over. <laughs> you know, just like I can't do what I do. And I, I really, you know, my books are so research focused. I, I live very close to UCLA. I've been in all seven research libraries. They are still closed to someone like me. I'm not a faculty member and I'm not a student. So the two main ways that I did research, one at UCLA, the other by going to the places that I write about, I couldn't do. So uh, I was walking by that shelf of books and this one book kind of popped out at me. I don't know why gray with darker gray lettering, reproducing women, pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I looked and I, you know, I had had that book on my shelf for 20 years and had never opened it. But I thought, here we are in the middle of a pandemic, now's the time. And I sat down right sort of where that little dog is. I started reading and I got to page 19 where there was a mention of a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty. That, in, I mean, it's extraordinary to be a woman doctor in the, or 15th century, right? But China does have a history of female doctors going back about 2000 years. However, in 1510, she published a book of her cases um, when, she would, when she turned 50. So think about that, 1510. Think about what books are still in print in English from before then, you know, the Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies, you know, go to some other countries, the Mahabharata, Beowulf, I think. But that's about it. And guess what? All of them written by men. So what she did was really extraordinary. Um, the her, you know, I, what I forgot to say was when I hit that on page 19, I came over here, I thought, I'm going to look her up. And that's when I found, um, you know, not just that book had been written, but that it was available in English and I ordered it and had it within 24 hours. So with, you know, from 26, we'll call it even 25 hours from when I saw the book on the shelf to when I decided this is the one um, that, that was just incredible. And, it, and everything with this particular book, I feel like it's been one moment after another of, of like coincidence, serendipity, fate, where it's just been here. Oh, here. And it, it's been such an incredible pleasure to write. So I turned it in today. Um, they have a thought that it will come out next March because it takes such a long time. But we'll see, you know, the editor has to like it. And maybe I'll just say one last comment that came in right in the last minute. Uh, Carol, not Carol Fitzgerald, a different Carol, uh, says your relative, um, 
And architect Gary Fong, with whom I worked, said to read your book when I told him how little I knew about uh, the Chinese in California. Um, she moved to she moved there from Boston in 1997. She says, I went on to buy many copies of On Gold Mountain to send to my pals back east. And oh. one friend has done some restoration work for your family in LA. I'm now in oh, Maine, but remain this. a fan. The world is small. Oh, I love that so much. So can I tell a quick story about Gary? I think I've got the right cousin. So Please do. when the very first freeway was built in Los Angeles, uh, that goes out to Pasadena. Um, my great uncle, Uncle Yun, our, he, he had, had all the kids packed in the car, 12 of them, and um, Gary fell out on the freeway as a little kid. Cause you know, the kids was like, you have so many kids in the car, just like flew out the window or something. Um, the, the other, I mean, he survived, he broke his arm, I think. And when they took him to the hospital, they wouldn't treat him because he was Chinese. Wow. Wow. And that was what year? I, I don't remember yeah. um, when that was, but. Okay. Yeah. Crazy things. Absolutely crazy things. Absolutely crazy things. You know, when I thought that after reading, uh, writing on Gold Mountain, you hone these research skills so well that to be able to weave it into fiction, it made you interested in historic settings in a different way. It made you interested in this. And I feel like I guess I discovered you on Snowflower and the Secret Fam in something like, like 2005, the year that I think that if you looked on Wikipedia, foot binding was the number one thing that people were going to look at because that was exactly what you would do when you were there. So do you think that it actually gave you this um, power to write historical fiction at that point? This feeling that, oh, wait, I've written my family's story. I know I can tackle history in a different way. Yes, and I actually, you know, my mother was a writer, my father was, it, what, is still living an anthropologist. I feel like I'm a total blending of them. Mm -hmm. But the, this idea, I think of talking about history, you know, we, we tend to learn history in the front line, the wars, the dates, the presidents, the generals. But if you take one step back, who's there? It's families, you know? and. and and they're there every single step of the way. We're seeing it on TV right now, all those families who are being separated um, in, in, in Ukraine. And so I, I really took that to heart when I was writing On Gold Mountain, that if I could tell this history through the eyes of one family, then people would connect to it. Because mm -hmm. of course we are a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody here had somebody in their family who was crazy enough, brave enough, scared enough to come here um, to seek a better life or you know, brought here against their will, but still brought here from somewhere else. And so maybe one family uses the coffee pot and somebody else uses the teapot, but we share in that immigrant experience of leaving your home country to come to this new place and, and eventually become American. And, mm -hmm. and what that means, but it only happens, it's not a historic, I mean, it is a historic fact, but it only happens on an individual level. It only happens within families. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it, it's just such an important thing to think about is we always see it through the microscope of who we are. We always see the world like through who we are. And by doing that, but then being able to tell the story of who other people are and bring that forth to us is something it's been a gift that you've given us for years with so many different parts of the world to think about we're looking at the island of sea women i mean just all the different places you've brought us you brought us a tea, a tea from you know poor tea you and i went to that little place in the city like a couple oh, yeah. blocks of our office and had tea and you were teaching me about tea and how to drink it and what to do and you think about all the experiences that have been brought it's a gift that what you've given us through the years and for that, I want to speak in behalf, I think, of everybody here today. Like, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to do this and, and for being so supportive over all these years. And to everybody who showed up today, and um, it, it's just great. I, just, it's, I could never have imagined this when that first day I went to talk to my great aunt. Yeah. That here I'd be, you know, 32 years later. And, yeah. and that this book would still be relevant, but also that I would still have the opportunity to talk about it.
to talk about it. And if, if, somebody, if I posted on Facebook that I was going to be doing this and somebody said, it's like one of those books that it's enduring. It's an enduring book. And I think that that's so important today. And I really meant that I really wish that people would take the time to read about another culture, another yeah. place, another family, because for doing that, I always remember, I always joke that when I was little, I, the geography class, when they say that Pedro wore the little poncho and Pedro went and did this, that was far better for me than worrying about the date of something and the date of whatever that you can look up. The story was what really, really mattered. Right. So, I thank you so much for joining us tonight for a very special evening. We look forward to doing something again with you for the next book, which we're looking forward to March, 2023 people. And as we know more, it'll be in the book reporter newsletter. As soon as we know more about it, it'll be there. So thanks for joining us. I love your little friend back there. He's so cute. He's really been very good. He's been a very good little dog. He's very, very good. Yeah, sometimes people have the dog come in and sit on the couch. It's not supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. To everybody, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, our next Bookachino Live book group is going to be on Wednesday, April 20th at 8 p.m. when Miranda Cowley Heller will be our author guest and she will be talking about The Paper Palace. Um, her debut novel. And yes, we're going to discuss that ending, which my book group, when we voted on it, people saw it two different ways. We talked to a couple of other book groups who saw the ending three different ways. So let her talk about that. Um, sign up for that evening event will be available on Book Reporter, Reading Group Guides, probably later this evening. We'll send it when we send a video of this event. And we will also um, have this uh, talk available on YouTube, as well as on a podcast. Give us to like the beginning of next week to get that up. And to stay on top of what we're doing at the Book Report Network, sign up for the newsletter. Um, our next Bookachino Live, Lively Talk About Books, is a monthly event where we talk about books coming in the next four weeks and preview some from a little bit further out. So there you go. That's what we are. That's what we do. And we thank you for joining us. And Lisa, once again, thanks for being part of a very special evening. Thank you.